a lot. Okay, so uh, but I would first want to thank the organizer for inviting me to this very nice conference, which is warm for the atmosphere and hot for the topics. So I'm very happy to be here. So I will be talking about somehow different materials which are uh, much more softer and sticky, like the one you have in adhesive tapes, like here. And here, this is a blow up showing that close to crack tips, indeed, you, your material is destroyed into fibrils which stretch to 10 times their initial length. So it's really somehow a difficult problem. Uh, but let's first talk uh, about Jay. <laughs> and uh, in fact, I, I've been knowing uh, Jay twice longer than he's been knowing me. <laughs> so <laughs> everything started from this uh, review, which I loved from 1999. And uh, I was studying uh, rocks and earthquakes at the time. So let's say this was when I was a geologist. <laughs> so anyway, then <laughs> sorry for the stupid joke. Uh, anyway, then I, I've been Jay has been changing different topics, and me too. And now I'm talking about soft materials, and he's studying soft materials too. So I'm very happy to follow his threads. Uh, then I don't have many uh, anecdotes about his life, but so since his birthday, I'll come with a with a present, an enigmatic present. You know, I think you don't understand what it is by now. Maybe that will help more. Nice. Huh? Maybe now you understand what it is. I'll add some more. This is a formal pre-invitation to give a nice lecture at the summer school next year, okay, in Cargede. We had already one a couple of years ago. Some people are here, and uh, some of you maybe will be there next year. It's also part of a joke because of the small star. That's because the school is not still validated. But anyway, that's also <laughs> a you are the only pre-invited speaker. <laughs> in case that we get validation. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, uh, and since this offer comes from an Italian, I'm sure you can understand the code which is hidden here. <laughs> okay. so let's get to science now. And uh, so I, I'll be talking about mainly about adhesives. On, and I will be talking about peeling adhesives, then making tack on adhesives, then trying to trigger these fibers to nice shapes and then trying to think, what about foam adhesives? This is just a teaser. And first, I want to tell why I do this, because indeed, soft materials are difficult already when they are elastic. Then if you put dissipation in, it gets a big mess somehow. But um, and more the point is that historically, mechanics of soft solids and viscoelastic materials have been quite separated in communities. Some people have been studying uh, um, soft elastic materials, which things start to be understood somehow. Then people have been studying soft viscoelastic, um, some viscoelastic solids, but they treat it as in small deformation with viscoelastic, linear viscoelasticity. Interesting. Or they've been studying viscoelastic fluids with large strain formalism. But indeed, for most materials which are relevant for technology, like additive tapes, softness and dissipation are frequently present at the same time, and there is no clear formalism on how to treat them. That's why it's interesting to do experiments in there. And there is strong nonlinear coupling between large strain deformation and large strain rheology, which is ill-defined de ill somehow. So let's try and understand easy stuff inside there. The main, main problem is that if in your material you have larger deformation and dissipation everywhere, then fracture mechanics is dead. This is the main problem. By meaning that, uh, in fact, you, you, you don't have any more uh, linear elasticity out or simple elasticity out of a process zone where everything bad happened. Dissipation is happening everywhere, so essentially things will depend on the sample shape in a very strong way. You change your sample, you change your results. Fracture energy will depend on the sample you use, and so in the end we can even question how to define fracture energy somehow. And this is very important for small samples or confined uh, samples like joints, film, or matrix of composites where these soft materials are frequently present in a very small region. And you, uh, when it's not uh, dissipative, we can use elasto with lengths. I'll try to use it and extend it, but it's subtle subject when there is viscous components inside. Let's try and see. So anyway, I'm here I want to recall a main message which has been already been used in, uh, in the last days, which is that sometimes when we want to introduce a dissipation or something else, we make a perturbation to a linear theory, and then maybe we get wrong because the real perturbation is very large. Okay? And this is one of the cases. When people want to make dissipation in fracture mechanics, then they take 
linear elastic fracture solution with a sharp crack and the stress singularity, which is very fine, then they add the switch on some sort of inelastic uh, behavior like plasticity, and then we say, hey, yeah, we here we yield here, and uh, we have Dugdale region, for example, or in uh, viscoelastic materials, we had a time dependent elastic modulus, and then we say, oh, now here we are stiff. Then um, sometime later we become viscous, and then sometime later we become uh, soft. And this gives a very nice idea, but this is perturbation which preserves the sharp crack. The problem is that when you take a soft material and you tear on it, what you see is this the sharpest, the crack is sharp initially when you tear on it, it blunts completely, which means that now the shape is totally different at the scale of the sample. Yeah, please. Yeah, but at different scales. The point is that I this is macroscopical sample, and now the size of the blunted region has the size of the sample. Okay? So, uh, anyway, uh, things are not dead. It's just, it's just a problem. At the scale where it blunts, there is no more singularity in a clear way. Not the same one, anyway. This is the main point. So I can sketch things this way. Now the crack tip shape has changed a lot. And at the scale where the crack tip is not sharp, we should change our limit boundary condition and change how things work. So let's first think about elastic materials where this red region of dissipation doesn't exist. We have fracture energy which is expanded here, we can define it. We can use Griffith theory, we can use J integral, we can define elastic blantic at, ela at this scale which is the elasto-adhesive scale somehow and things are quite good. The problem is that when we go to these uh, sticky materials at the scale where you have large strain, you dissipate a lot of energy. So this scale where you have to calculate your energy is comparable in size with the scale of the blunting. So you are completely, the perturbation is destroying all your field at the relevant scale where you want to calculate uh, dissipation. And then sometimes you can have a dissipation even outside. And so in the end, you have to try and separate what is associated to crack propagation and what is associated to the sample deformation about dissipation. So let's concentrate on this one. We try to figure out one hypothesis to talk about this one. And this is that indeed, when this we make experiments at steady state of propagating crack at a given velocity, we measure fields of displacement and everything, and we try to describe things simply. For example, here you can say that generally uh, the deformation will go from almost zero to larger deformation, finite deformation that we measure here, and generally it's finite, finite deformation, uh, sort of uniaxial in the end here, and it's over a region that we can identify here. And now, so we can, now we know that if we divide the maximum deformation by the time to go through the process zone, we get the characteristic strain rate of this region, so we can imagine the response of this sticky material at this characteristic strain rate, and if we make an integral of this up to the maximum strain which we measure, we get the density of energy that we had to feed in, in some way. Now, if we take this volume density, we multiply by the volume of the process zone and we divide by the area, we remain with radius of the crack of the process zone, more or less. This multiplies this integral of the energy that you feed into this region. It's very rough, but it gives nice order of magnitude of what's happening in a nice way, and it doesn't suffer from the problem of perturbing cracks, as I told before. That's quite a descriptive way. The nice thing is that it has no parameter. These are just things to you measure. So we made measurement on different systems about this and try to see if you get good um, results. So, but this is generally about fracture. Then if we go to a um, problem of confined material, now sometimes the material can become as small that you don't express anymore this region. So at this level, you will not be proportional to the size of the process zone, but to the thickness of the sample, okay? And now we are going to peeling. What do we have to do to go to peeling? Indeed, you have to take this picture, then you have to cut in two, and here you put your substrate. Then you have to cut 20 micron of your layer, and then uh, uh, you want to put the substrate here and the backing, stiff backing here. And now you say, what about the crack singularity? It, it lives out of the space of the pro this problem, okay? <laughs> it, 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 so here you are in a region of stress concentration, forget about crack singularity in this region, and you have to treat things different. And you can see this by the fact that the last two adhesive length that you would have in the material, in the bulk, 
is much larger than the thickness of the sample. Okay, so you are in a region where stresses are <laughs> finite. And you can treat it as homogeneous through this and correlate it in a lateral way. The second point is that the most soft materials, which are made by uh, polymers or hydrogen or whatever, they are soft but incompressible, which means that now if they are confined between two stiff objects and you tear on this, you can't expand it without cavitating. And as long as you, and when you tear on it, you develop negative pressure, and as long as the level negative pressure goes larger than Young modulus, which is very weak, you make cavities, and then you damage your material, and then you go to this, okay? You make cavities which become strings, and this is the picture I showed you in the beginning, and this was quite well known also in intact experiments where you put the same material between two flat punches, you open it, and in order to open it, you have to make cavities which then become strings. Okay, so now, where is the crack tip? Okay, yeah, this is a strong perturbation, very strong perturbation, which will deeply change the mechanism. And in the end, the point is that you should rather see this as that, a series of springs which develop and which are snapped off. And so now the point is not a crack tip here, is how do these snap off? And when they snap off, the whole work you've been putting in, elastic, inelastic, what you like, even if it's a fluid, this work is lost, so you have a loss by theoretical uh, loading of fibrils. Yeah. I don't understand the argument. So the claim is that this region where you have the, uh, the fibers is just bigger than the thickness. Now the point is that. Zoom out. It, uh, there's stuff happening there, but so far away. Now the point is that uh, uh, it is here. The, the region that would happen in the bulk soft material mm -hmm. is bigger than the sample we are looking at. So this singularity will not happen, it's not just a question of zooming. You are completely changing things. Now you are tearing on a material where you can't develop the singularity because it's out of the sample. You can't zoom out because there is no sample here. <laughs> okay, somehow. And the point is that now these fibers develop all along. So you, you are uh, deforming all of your thickness. So if you take a thicker sample, you get more dissipation, and your dissipation is proportional to the thickness of the sample, which is not typical in fracture mechanics, somehow. <laughs> yeah? Just as a conceptual point of view, not to contest anything you're saying, but this actually looks much sharper than a crack tip in a brittle material. In a brittle material, it looks much blunter than this. It's rounded. It's, it's parabola. So it's yeah, in fact, you should see the, this straight line here yeah. as the beginning of a huge parabola. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it depends on scale. Here it looks blunted on a scale which is larger than the system. So it looks straight in the end. This is the point. So anyway, let's see what we do with that. In fact, uh, the point is that now we should treat this as a sort of uh, Winkler foundation with springs between a flexible backing and a substrate. And this is how people studied things in the 50s. It's a very old way to do. But they used linear springs, linear elastic springs, so it was not perfect. The one who made very interesting advance, it was just an idea, is Jensen Petrich in 69, which told, oh, if you put viscoelastic strings and nonlinear viscoelastic springs, then this would behave like that, not just like, uh, like that. And indeed, now he put an equation which looked very similar to what I showed before, very similar. The thickness is here. And this is the work uh, to deform your material. And the only point it was a little wrong is that it just put the criterion of stress. You don't have energy anymore, so it decided there is a maximum stress. And we'll see that this criterion is very difficult. But if you use this maximum stress, you can understand that if the interface is weak, then there's no difference between these materials. They have similar linear behavior. But th if the maximum stress is here, these two will give a very different integral, so very different uh, energy. So nonlinear rheology is very important. And we provide today some experimental validation of this concept. So let's go to experiments. In order to go to experiments, uh, as Jay say, we must have a good problem and then make very good measurement. And to make good measurement here, you need to make measurement on six decades of velocity in order to show something interesting. So we should couple different experiments. Low velocity is just a weight which is peeling off the tape. Intermediate velocity is an instrument machine. And then at high velocity, a very weird 
equipment developed at fast in the uh, south of Paris, which has a rail which is going at four meters per second, and then we are peeling off uh, very fast. <laughs> then when you put all of this together, and then time scales are not enough, you have also to go through special scales, because fracture is a multi-scale problem, and you, measure, you make measurement at this scale, and then you make measurement at the size of the debonding region. So every time we go and have, a, for each one of our measurements, we go and measure what's happening here in a good steady state system, so that everything is well defined, the energy which is flowing, everything is well defined. This profile is steady state. And here you see this region, you can measure the stretch of the fibers, you can measure the extension of this region, and try to make things right somehow. If you look from the bottom, you see that the situation is more complex. It's not just fibrils. There is complex instabilities which go over uh, cavitation at some level, then they become fibrils, then they have very tiny complex region sticking to the surface. But then now just let's forget it. Let's think about fibrils, then we'll see something better. So now to go over, I want to talk about Richard Villay, which is the big protagonist here, because he developed a much advanced technique for peeling, which means that uh, now, by starting from these images, he was able to use the, the flexible uh, deflection profile of the backing in order to make the difference between a free elastica and a, a, a tape with forces applied here. Okay? In order, it's a very difficult problem because you have to have a fourth derivative estimated, so we decided to get one parameter out. Because if you want more, you'll get too much uh, weak precision. This is not too bad. So we get the size of the region, or two parameters, the size of the region, which is easy to say, and the average stress on this. Then we get uh, the strain rate, the strain, maximum strain and strain rate. I show very quickly here, but then there is this paper which uh, is in the references. We just have a, so a constant stress parallel to the fibrils, one value, up to a characteristic um, distance, which is the length of this region. We put all this together with the elastic equation, and, uh, and we get out the average stress, the size of the cohesive zone, the maximum stretch, and the strain rate, because this is moving, okay? That's constant velocity. And these are bounded together. We only have two independent ones, and the fracture energy can be written in an exact way as the sum of this average stress by the stretch of the fiber, okay? And now, if you look at fracture energy increasing with velocity, we can see that this is power low with 0.2, and now the stress is changing with velocity with the higher power low, and this is compensated by the fact that the maximum strain is reducing with velocity with a weak power low. And the two sum together, they give this. So we understand something more about how things happen in the mechanism. And uh, then we did more. We wanted to change the rheology of the tapes, and try to change the nonlinear behavior to show that this is the important part. So we asked friends in 3M to make us tapes in a different way, and to make us tapes in a specific way so that we can change independently the linear rheology, without, and then we can change the nonlinear rheology in an independent way. This is quite tricky. I show you here how we do. If you take an elastomer, this is linear rheology, that, that it will be glassy, then soft, and then if it's cross-linked, it will stay or it will flow. A PSA, an adhesive tape like this, is badly cross-linked. So indeed here we keep uh, an, um, an entangling and you only feel the level of cross-linkage at a very long time. And the red region here is the time which is necessary to stretch the fibrils. So in this region here where we peel over the six decades, the linear rheology of our tapes is the same even if we change the cross-linking level, okay? But now if in the same time duration we make stretch of fibrils on a machine, then we will feel the nonlinear rheology in a different way by feeling the maximum stretch, okay? So in this region we have same linear rheology and different nonlinear rheology. Yeah? In fact, uh, the time scale is the time scale for stretching a fibril. In fact, you have a steady state velocity, you go when, um, is the time for going through the process zone, depending on velocity. Which is, if you see a fixed fiber, it is the time for it from go to zero to maximum stretch and the bond. And uh, if you see uh, the bonding region which is traveling at a fixed point, is the time to be crossed by the whole the bonding region. Like 
because if you wait for a very long time, your material will flow and will stop at the moment where cross-linked are tight. The cross-link determines a percolating network. If you don't have cross-link, you will flow. If you put cross-link, you will hear very late. Huh? At some point, you, stra you strain harden and you block. And if you put a little more, you will strain harden before. But always long time later. So you only feel it long time or short time if you do it nonlinear. In large strain, you go straight to large deformation and you feel it. Okay? Is this linear reality that you measure for bulk in the reometer? Yeah. Small deformation of our. Is the response of the fiber not determined by the you know, geometry of necking more than the reality of the. That is, let's measure rheology and then let's see about what about necking. Uh, we measure rheology, we measure uniaxial extension of a well conditioned example, and then we think what really happens when, when necking. Okay. When we measure rheology, we can measure with different rates. You know, it's elongation rate, but we put epsilon. It's, it's, uh, elongation, this is just to make things rate. easy. It's not rate. It's, it's no, no, no. Uh, the, this is elongation, and then if we change rate, we change okay. the, the this. Yeah. If you change rate, you change this curve going up. Yeah. It's also maybe getting like this. I, I show you data. Oh. Okay. <coughs> it's better. So here I show you data about the. Uh, fracture energy curves as a function of velocity, okay? The point is that when I told you, I asked them to change dust transition temperature. And this can make, a, uh, if we shift data on the velocity curve, you can superpose to a master curve. And uh, if you change linear rheology, everything is the same if you change velocity, like WLS principle. This works well. But now we have two different uh, master curves, one for each reticulation rate. Okay, so these two are not catchable <coughs> by linear rheology, which would predict the same thing. Since they have the same linear rheology, you would predict for any model, I don't want to tell you which model is better, linear models would predict one curve, which scales into one curve. Now you have two. And in fact, you can interpret the fact that you have two by what I told, and which is seen in experiments, that now, same condition, if you put more cross-linker, the fiber will debond at a shorter length. Okay, so things start the same, then they debond at shorter lengths. And indeed, that is why it's good to have multi-scale analysis. Now we can measure that if we increase velocity and the energies are getting closer, then we also measure that the maximum length is getting closer, and at some point they go together. Okay, so this is more than a fit. Okay, it's just checking what happens. And then we went more. Uh, farther by measuring nonlinear rheology and seeing if the model works. Okay, so we put our tapes without backing into a, an extensional rheometer like this. And we measure at different strain rates, and then we. C this is linear rheology. You can see that in the working region, the two are the same; they differ at a uh, low frequency. And in nonlinear rheology, you can see a clear strain hardening, which is anticipated. Okay, so let's see what happens. <coughs> And this is a crude test of the model, which came this year, thanks to Julien Chopin. These are the curves for the two tapes for different strain rates, increasing strain rates. And we plug on this the measured maximum stretch of the fibrils, so that we can calculate the integral, multiply by the thickness, and we have a prediction of gamma. Okay? And the nice thing is that, that, in fact, there is a good news and the bad news. The good news is that we get two curves. The two curves have the good distance, and, the tr and they have the good slopes, okay? The bad news is that we had to multiply everything by a factor of four, <laughs> okay, <laughs> larger. So I could say this is scaling loads, but it's not scaling loads. This model is more precise than this somehow. The point is that we should question the exact uniaxiality of the traction, as it was questioned before. But it's nice that independent of uniaxiality, you get the effect of nonlinear rheology, you get the distance, you get the slope. Then I show why there is this factor, uh, why, it's an hypothesis of why. I, don't know. I will show you why in a few years. So we went to look at smaller scale and see what happens at these fibers. This is, uh, there's two things. The first one is that we didn't want to look at the mass I showed before. So we make sticky patches on the substrate so that the fibers are well organized in a square lattice. They're in lines and then we, we can study a more well-defined system to say something about how these fibers are born. 
And here there is an animation, hope working, yeah, of stretching these fibers. You see that here th they have string stringing instability. You have a peel, peel off and then they go back. And uh, the nice point I show again is that indeed, uh, so these fibers are not extensionally stretched, they are drawn from uh, a layer. So this is more complex condition, even here. And we have to understand this condition to understand why it's four times larger. That's what we are studying. And then the main point is that here, you can understand something about the debonding condition. You see that it's not a constant stress. Not here, not here. And the nice thing is that when you change cross-linking, it's very different kind of dependency of the maximum stretch on the strain rate. And this is what we have to understand, because it's this who really explains the difference of slope here. Because the strain rate dependency of the rheology is quite similar for the two. But the integration limit keeps the real important information. And so we have to understand how do these fibers demand, which is a very difficult problem. They are very stretched. They have patterns of instabilities there. So this is work for the next five years. Yeah, but uh, the, here the sample is stretched to 100%. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's uh, yeah, it is, it is. Both yeah. Yet even here, the the elasto adhesive length is much larger than the scale at which we look the problem. It's a soft fracture progress, yeah. but better than the other one, better than the other one. <laughs> so anyway, so I showed you that between this and extension doesn't work very well. But now let's try. Please move. Yeah. Let's try to check between this and TAC. Because in TAC, you do the same thing to fibrils. OK? And uh, I think I have a short answer. I go quite fast on that. Anyway, you don't like chemistry, I suppose. Took other tapes and everything. We make TAC measurements. We integrate the work of adhesion. And the nice thing is that we get a very good correlation between <coughs> TAC energy of adhesion, the energy to separate the surfaces, and the energy to peel. This, once that you uh, use our instrumented peeling to get what is the good strain rate. That is, if you plot data where the fibrils have the same strain rate at the same confinement, then you get the same energy. Okay? It's not easy because when you want to uh, compare TAC with peeling, so TAC you have a velocity here, peeling you have a velocity of peeling, and then the strain rate is delicate, depends on the fibril. But once you look at fibrils and you get the good strain rate, and you compare with the strain rate in TAC, you have same energy, same average stress, and same maximum strain, which means you are revealing the same mechanism in the two of them, OK? Then, and I see, so I, I can stop even here, but I just want to show in very fast, how much? Five minutes. Oh, OK, I'll finish with ease. In order to test some of the ideas, we try to get rid of the cavitation. How do we get rid of cavitation? We take a, a foam tape, which is cavitated already so that it will not change shape when we peel on it. So that is good, because now the behavior it will have is the same as the uniaxial behavior. And now not only we have the same behavior in peel and tack, but we also have very good agreement between the model I told you before and the adherence energy. We don't have the factor four anymore, because now there is no mechanism. It's really a stretch, OK? Close to uniaxial, because it's cavitated, it's free, and so it's not incompressible. So this is a good guide. And also, I told you, la this is the last one. Uh, it is interesting to ask, how do we change between different uh, equipment? So tack and peel, we managed to do that, but the two are traction dominated. Now if you go to shear, there is no hydrostatic. So you should not cavitate, and that's very different. And uh, sometimes paper tape, which behave well in tack, they behave bad in shear. And, uh, it's quite delicate. So we try to, this is we really started a few months ago. I just show you one image about this, which uh, is done by Ellen Minsky, and which showed that in the latest stage of shear, and due to the fact that this is a solid and not a fluid, you end up with doing cavitation. So this is the, over, this is the end of the glass here, and this is the end of the tape. So it's going down here, and you're seeing stretching fibers and cavitation. I think you see them better on the movie on the side. <coughs> yeah. You have cavities forming and then coalescing. So we understand nothing about that now, but it's just the idea that 
if you shear a lot, then in the end you stretch a solid. So you will end to get some relation. And we hope to go to this. And in order to get between one and the other, we can't go through uh, interfacial energy. We must go through mechanism, how they are revealed and caused by the different kind of sample. So I'll go to conclusion, which is, let's breathe. <laughs> uh, the point is that to understand the tackiness of tapes, so you have, you have to go into large strain. It is essential to go into large strain in order to dissipate a lot of energy. You need large integral of stretch strain behavior. And in the end, the energy is lost by uh, rate-dependent elastic hysteresis, which is not simply viscoelasticity. It could be also elastic. If you make elastic fibers and you uh, pull it off, they will dissipate. Since it is large strain, then you need large strain rheology to explain it. Then the other point is that in these tapes, the confinement is fundamental because these materials are soft but uncompressible. And so this, the presence of the backing causes cavitation, which then leads to stringing. And it sets free the tape to be able to stretch. So you need this confinement. If you just take a layer and peel it off, it will break somehow. And also, I am happy to present this instrumented peeling technique, which makes peeling not just applying a force and measuring the velocity, but making images of what are the mechanisms, what happened. And also like to show in the beginning, I said that this kind of modeling is very interesting for fracture too, as long as you have materials which have a large dissipation and hysteresis. So most of the work you feed in, even if you don't have fibers, will be lost because of hysteresis of materials. This is studied in many tough gels at present. Uh, open question, I already did them. We have to understand the role of triaxiality, criterion of the bonding, Still open question. The position of the stick slip instability, now we understand it's dependent on large strain, but we have to make it clear. And the role of the substrate, because now we don't have any more the Dupre adhesion energy in our equation. We have a stress or something else. What's the ring? And then happy birthday again and some papers here.